Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'm happy to be here tonight to welcome our members, our friends, and guests to the first monthly speaker meeting of the Society's 2020-2021 season. Not only is this our first meeting of the season, it's also our very first online meeting ever. And according to my participants list, let me bring that up. We now have 79 participants. Uh, 79 people are now watching live. So here we are tonight, 142 years old, still standing and still making history. Welcome to all. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my team of fellow officers, council and committee members and past presidents whose blood, sweat, tears and endless emails kept us moving forward this year despite COVID-19. Without their hard work and support, we would not be streaming live right now or sponsoring field trips, which are now in full swing with COVID-19 safety guidelines in place. In fact, today's field trip in Central Park, by the way, was incredible. We saw a total of 61 species, including 17 warblers. And it was great to just be out in the park and see so many friends again as well. If you're interested in attending a future field trip, please go to our newly designed website at LinnaeanNewYork.org. That's LinnaeanNewYork.org for more information about field trips and programs. Because this is all new and still evolving, I'd like to take a moment to explain a few things. The American Museum of Natural History has canceled all program events through November of this year. It's quite likely that we may not get to resume our holding our meetings in the Linder Theater until sometime later in 2021. We'll have to await word from the museum on that. We will keep everyone updated on our website as to when we may expect to the return to the museum. The good news, however, is that until we're able to resume our meetings there, we plan to bring you our monthly meetings here online via Zoom. One of the new changes in our online format will be, we'll only be featuring one speaker at each meeting. Once we resume meetings at the museum, we'll switch back to two speakers. As in the past, we will conduct a business meeting that will take place at the start of the evening. Once our business uh, items are completed, the evening speaker will be introduced. For tonight's program, we've disabled the Zoom chat feature so you don't have to worry about muting yourself if your dog is barking or if the air conditioner is too loud. We also have disabled your video so no one can see you. So no worries there about your wardrobe or if you're having a bad hair day, sit back, relax, be yourself and enjoy the program. However, in our new format, we have enabled Zoom's Q&A feature. During tonight's program, you may use that feature at the bottom of your screen to send us a question. Following our speaker's presentation, Vice President Rochelle Thomas will select a few questions from the audience. And now on to our business. Because we have recently taken the opportunity to vote by email, and thank you members for sending in your return email votes, uh, we only have uh, a single business item. With 114 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition, it gives me great pleasure to announce the following six applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. Astas Goser, by Chuck, sponsored by Chuck McAlexander. Erica J. Garcia, sponsored by Chuck McAlexander. Janet Wooten, sponsored by Andrew Rubenfeld. Kevin J. Sisko, sponsored by Ken Chea, Will Papp, and Kathleen Matthews. William Andrew Haluska, sponsored by Kathleen Matthews. And Diana Lennon, sponsored by Ken Chea. 
If any of you are out there watching right now, imagine you are hearing a thunderous applause. And congratulations, Asta, Erica, Janet, Kevin, William, and Diana, and welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And by the way, if any of you out there are wondering about becoming members, oh, we would love to hear from you. Just go to our website, linnaeannewyork.org, and you'll find all the information you need. And just in case you need a sponsor and you don't know many members yet, I'll be happy to sponsor you. You can contact me about sponsorship or any other officers of the society by going to the bottom of our website homepage and clicking on contacts. There you will find our email addresses and you can contact any one of us. It doesn't have to be me. Any one of us for more information. Remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We would love to hear from you and welcome you to our community. And now it's my pleasure to announce this evening's speaker. The island of New Guinea is home to more than 700 species of birds, that is 700 and counting. In the fall of 2014, Paul Sweet joined a team of vertebrate specialists from the American Museum of Natural History on an expedition to the highlands of Papua New Guinea the nation that occupies the eastern half of the island. The highlands are one of the most remote areas in the world. The expedition was in search of new specimens and new species. Tonight, Paul Sweet will talk about the adventures of field work and discuss some of the expedition's discoveries. Born in Bristol, England, Paul Sweet has been interested in birds for as long as he could remember. After completing a degree in zoology at the University of Liverpool, he traveled widely in Asia and the Americas before working at the Raffles Museum in Singapore. In 1991, Paul moved to New York City to work at the American Museum of Natural History, where he is now the collections manager in the ornithology department. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Sweet. Unmute, Paul. <laughs> Hi. You hear me? Can you see me? Hello. I can see you, Paul. Okay, it says I'm muted by the host. Is that true? Now I'm unmuted by the host. Okay, are we good? Yes, I think so. Good. Well, um, thank you for that introduction, Ken. That's very nice. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I know a lot of my friends and fellow birders are out there tonight, so it's great to uh, see your names at least, if not your faces. Um, so yes, tonight I'm going to try, well, what I'm gonna do now is try and share my screen. We'll take the next step in this uh, tech here. And let's see. Um, I hope that's working. Can somebody give me, no, here we go. I think that's is good. Can somebody give me the thumbs up on that? Looks good, Paul. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So I guess I'm ready to go. Well, um, so yeah, exploring in the 21st century. Um, this expedition was um, came about because of an initiative at the museum called Explore 21, hence the name, which was um, something that the museum uh, trustees um, came up with to kind of encourage, if you like, um, old school expeditionary field work. Um, they put up some money and they offered the money to staff. To, so we had a competitive um, uh, program to try to uh, get these awards. And um, the idea was it would be multidisciplinary, in more than one department and try to use um, modern techniques along with sort of old school uh, field collecting. So um, 
I was fortunate enough to be part of the team that was uh, chosen to go to Papua New Guinea. Um, oh, someone calling me? No, that's good. Okay, let's see if we can advance the slides. Oh, here we go. So, um, where in the world is Papua New Guinea? Most of you, I'm sure, know where New Guinea is, but in case you don't, um, here's a little map. Um, New Guinea lies directly to the north of Australia um, and to the east of Indonesia. Um, in fact, part of it is Indonesia. It's um, here's some basic um, facts and figures about uh, Papua New Guinea. It's uh, approximately the size of California in terms of land area. It has a population of 7.3 million. Even though, uh, so it's in the tropics, but it has mountains that get over 14,000 feet. And there are actually uh, snow caps on some of those mountains. Although sadly, many of the glaciers up there are melting now. Um, apart from the main uh, island of of New Guinea, there are many smaller offshore islands, some of them quite large. New Britain, New Ireland, Bougainville are all part of uh, New Guinea. Um, as well as a diversity of um, wildlife, there's also an amazing human diversity there. And uh, there are 848 languages recorded. Um, oh, I'm getting a text, make sure it's not skipping. No, it's not good. Um, I don't know if I'm getting through to you guys. So. Um, most of the um, people, however, do speak a language named uh, called Tok Pisin or Pidgin, which is uh, widely spoken by a um, majority of people there. And that's generally the language that our team used to communicate with the local people that we were with. Most of the people live um, in rural set settings, often way out in the bush. There are almost no roads in the country, only a very small network. Um, and um, most of the people are actually living off the land by subsistence agriculture. Um, okay, yeah. So here's a map of um, New Guinea proper. Um, you can see uh, that it's a largely, um, most of it is, is on the big island, but there are lots of little islands off to the side there. Um, I mentioned uh, Tok Pisin. Here's an example uh, of this language. Um, it's quite an easy language to learn. If you can look at this sign here, you'll see um, no can come inside. So that means uh, don't come inside. This is a, you know, it's basically a, a English that's been um, creolized. So um, biogeographically, New Guinea is um, part of the same continental area that belongs, which is uh, Australia, called uh, Sahul. Um, during the Pleistocene, New Guinea and uh, Australia were uh, part of the same landmass. So obviously their faunas are rather similar. Um, they share a lot of uh, taxa in common, it's certainly. And um, it's separated from mainland Southeast Asia by um, an area which we call Wallacea. This is um, an area named after Alfred Russell Wallace, who um, explored this area in the 1850s and 60s. Um, one of the more interesting bi biogeographic findings from Wallace was um, that the, the uh, fauna of the uh, continental Southeast Asia has an, many of the taxa have abrupt uh, ends at this point just to the east of Bali and um, for things like woodpeckers, um, many um, um, typical mainland uh, mammal fauna such as carnivores, you know, weasels, cats, etc. don't cross that line. And um, there's an interesting area in the middle uh, that's named Wallacea which has um, sort of transitional fauna. And then when we get to the Australian New Guinea plate, we have a whole different fauna, uh, which includes you know, marsupials and all the typical uh, New Guinean fauna like birds of paradise. So um, 
New Guinea is a well known as a biodiversity hotspot, even though it only has half of a percent of the Earth's land mass, um, it actually has something between five and 10% of the Earth's species. Um, the bird fauna is up to about 779 species recorded there. And of those, 621 are breeding species. So that's in an area, remember, to um, the size of California. Um, it also is uh, home to uh, migrants uh, from Asia and Australia, so both Austral and uh, Palearctic migrants. And 59% uh, of the species that occur there are uh, endemic to New Guinea. But even to this day, it is rather uh, poorly studied. So that brings us to a little bit about the bird fauna. Um, I have to tell you right off that these are not my photographs. Um, I don't take photographs in the field of birds. Um, that would be way too complicated when we're doing field work. So these are all uh, um, taken from the internet. And if you, excuse me, one second, I'm just gonna turn on my air conditioning. A bit hot. So um, yeah, one of the more, what, some of the typical birds uh, of New Guinea, some of the classic birds, um, cassowaries of course, these are huge flightless birds um, related to emus, they are forest birds. Uh, there are three species of them in New Guinea. Um, one of them also gets into Northern Australia. Um, there's an amazing variety of pigeons, um, ranging from things like these, uh, this Victoria crowned pigeon, the turkey size uh, pigeon of the forest floor to dozens of different kinds of uh, fruit doves and uh, other amazing um, varieties of pigeon. Another group of birds um, restricted to Wallachia and uh, the, this um, Australasian region are the megapodes, these are birds in the galliform order related to uh, pheasants and chickens, etc. But they're unique in that they um, uh, don't build a nest. They lay their eggs in piles of uh, veg vegetation that they um, that will... Uh, okay, my Zoom presentation is coming through perfectly. That's good. Um, that they use to the composting uh, vegetation incubates the eggs and the, the young emerge from these um, mounds um, ready to go. They're completely uh, able to, to fend for themselves. Um, hornbills, which we typically think of as a more Asian and um, African group, one species does get out into um, New Guinea and it's actually quite common, the Papuan hornbill uh, or Blight's hornbill. It's very it's a huge bird and often flocks of them would, would fly over us in camp, which was amazing. Uh, the group that New Guinea is perhaps most best known for, uh, Birds of Paradise. Here are a few examples on the left, the 12 wired, top right, we have the King of Saxony and bottom right, the King Bird of Paradise. Um, amazing, amazing birds. Um, if anyone hasn't seen them yet, you should definitely take a look at the uh, Tim Lehman videos that are all over YouTube, um, seeing some of these birds display. They're really fantastic uh, videos. Here's a few more um, of Birds of Paradise. Black Sicklebill, magnificent uh, bird of paradise in the north or um, in, the, in, the, in the top right, um, or Magbop as we call them. And uh, down in the bottom right, the Blue Bird of Paradise. So, I mean, they're just an amazing variety of, of birds of paradise with incredibly complex uh, in male plumages and, and uh, behaviors. So they're really fantastic. Um, okay, amongst the other non-passerines, there is an incredible diversity of kingfishers. I mean, most places you go, there are a few kingfishers, but New Guinea has, I don't even know how many, but there's probably at least 30, I would think, species of kingfisher, uh, depending on how you look at your species limits. But there are tons of kingfishers, ranging from kookaburras, which are like the size of a crow, down to tiny dwarf kingfishers, you know, that are a sizable warbler. 
Uh, this particular bird is the yellow-billed kingfisher. And as I mentioned before, um, doves are very diverse and quite beautiful there, like the superb fruit dove. Parrots are also a very diverse group there. Um, many, many kinds of parrots. The whole range of lorikeets. Um, you have the vulturine or pesquet's parrot, which is a, a fantastic bird. We saw quite a lot of those. These things like this tiger, uh, Brehm's tiger parrot, lots of tiger parrots. You have pygmy parrots that crawl on the tree trunks like nut hatches. Um, you have cockatoos, giant cockatoos, palm cockatoos, all kinds of uh, amazing uh, diversity of parrots. And likewise, passerines are very uh, interesting there. A lot of families that you only find in New Guinea. Um, up top on the left is the hooded pitahui. Um, Pitahuis are known to be some of the only poisonous birds in the world, if eaten. Um, one of my favorite were these uh, chestnut-backed jewel babblers. They're a fantastic understory forest birds, very, very hard to see. The blue-capped ifrit um, down in the left corner, uh, that's an endemic family to New Guinea. And this white-winged robin, even though it's not really a robin, um, beautiful birds that are quite common around our camp. Uh, another group that's very uh, diverse in New Guinea are the honey eaters. Um, many, many kinds of honey eaters. This is, this is Belford's Melodectes, a very diverse group in New Guinea uh, and Australia. Um, fantails, like the bird in the top right, the friendly fantail, are uh, quite diverse in New Guinea. These are cute little uh, forest birds that behave a little bit like an American red star. They flash their, they fan their tail and flash them, um, I think, to startle insects. Um, bottom left, another honey eater, the um, red collared Mysomala, and another nice group, the Whistlers, um, another diverse group in New Guinea. This one happens to be the Regent Whistler down here. Oh, I, think you can, I hope you can see my cursor. I don't know if you can or not. So, um, History of biological exploration of New Guinea um, kind of starts with uh, Magellan's expedition to New Guinea um, that uh, in 1522 brought the first birds of paradise uh, to Europe. Of course, all the birds of New Guinea were well known to the people of New Guinea long before any Europeans got there, but um, they first became known in the West um, at that's this time. Magellan himself, um, as you probably know, didn't make it back after the, on the circumnavigation. I think he died in the Philippines, but some of his crew brought back these um, trade skins from New Guinea. Um, trade skins were, were prepared by uh, the people of the Aru Islands, uh, mostly lesser birds of paradise, um, for decorative purposes, and they were traded amongst the people of the islands in um, what is now Indonesia. Um, and the, the ones that were brought back, typically they're made um, with no feet. The feet are cut off. And initially people in, in Europe thought that these birds actually had no feet. Um, and one bird of paradise was named by Linnaeus Paradisia apoda, meaning having no feet. But um, you can see in some of these illustrations here from the uh, Renaissance um, Gessner and Algravandi, they painted, they, they had these specimens and uh, they are basically the trade skins. These look exactly like the, the birds we have in our, in our department. Um, AMNH first got involved with New Guinea with uh, Daniel Giraud Elliott, who was one of the founders of the museum. Um, he commissioned a monograph of Birds of Paradise, um, illustrated, I believe, by Wolf. Am I right here? I think it was Wolf was the illustrator. Um, in 1873, one of the interesting things about this book is that um, basically nothing was known about the behavior of these birds, and the illustrations are in terms of the poses and what the birds are doing are completely fantasy. Um, none of these uh, birds, nobody knew what the birds did with these odd 
uh, feather groups and um, they they just uh, the artist just kind of created these out of out of whole cloth basically. Um, then in the early 20th century, the AMNH um, mounted its first expedition to New Guinea. Um, Leonard Samford of AMNH and Lord Walter Rothschild of the Tring Museum um, hired a young German called Ernst Meyer and sent him to collect in the Arfak Mountains, which are in the what's known as the Bird's Head area of um, what was then Dutch New Guinea in the west. Um, and those specimens, uh, initially, um, some of them went to Tring, but now, because after uh, some of you may have heard of the scandal with Rothschild, after that, um, Amanich bought his collection, and so everything ended up back with us. So we have all of Meyer's collections from those days. Then uh, there was a period from, from the 30s to the 60s of the AMNH Archbold expeditions. These were um, organized, organized by Richard Archbold. You might have heard of him with the Archbold Biological Station in, in Florida. But um, he put uh, several teams of people together um, over many expeditions to explore um, mostly New Guinea. And at that time, he was also an aviator, so tried out various uh, ways to get into some of the more remote areas, which he was successful at. For example, uh, the Belim Valley in what is now um, uh, Pap uh, Indonesian Papua. Um, he was able to get in there by landing on a lake on this flying boat. Um, and this was an area that was basically unknown to the outside world until that time. Um, later in the 20th century, Tom Gilliard, um, former curator of my department, um, mounted multiple expeditions into the mountains of New Guinea uh, with his wife, uh, Margaret. Um, and the interesting thing to me on, for some, from these photographs is how little has really changed. I mean, basically, you'll see in a minute that the way we do expeditions now is really... Um, not that much different. Um, we walk into the field, we have, uh, we carry all of our gear and we carry, I mean, there's no way I could manage to carry anything, I'm useless, but um, local folks, uh, we hire them to help us uh, get into the field. And um, Gilliard was actually a, a filmmaker as well. So you can see here, there's a lot of uh, camera equipment uh, going in. And then, uh, Basically, uh, working with our local guides, this is Gilliard here, with a table, um, prep table, that you'll see in my later pictures, uh, pretty much exactly the same. Um, just built quickly from local materials, tarp over the top, and that's your lab. So, um, why are we doing this? Well, you know, lots of Lots of reasons, but one of the big reasons is we've had a revolution in um, biology in the last few decades where we have been able to use DNA to understand relationships of birds, how they're, you know, evolved from each other, how they, you know, where they came from, what species limits are. And um, in, in order to do this work, we need fresh uh, genetic material. So that's you know, some of the work that's been done um, in recent years on genetics has been based on these specimens uh, that we've collected. And um, we were also fortunate enough to have, um, well, this is sort of a mutual thing. Most of our specimens, um, we have the largest New Guinea collection in the world and our specimens were heavily used in the creation of this new book, which fortunately we had in our hands just before we left for New Guinea, and it's really a fantastic book. Um, most of these maps here are obviously generated by, spe by specimen records. Very few uh, birders actually get to go into these areas. So um, collections are really key to the, to the making of this book. And also the artists, of course, borrowed all these specimens from us in order to uh, make the plates. So it's kind of a nice project that we were able to profit from during our trip. 
So just want to get back to our expedition. This is the AMNH team. Um, it was a vertebrates only trip. So we had uh, this gentleman here, Brett Benz. He was our leader. He's very experienced at working in New Guinea. He's done many, many, many expeditions there. He, he's lived there for a time. He speaks fluent pigeon. And uh, he actually went in two months before we did to scout and to find the site and to get things organized. So uh, he, was, he was really the key to uh, making this uh, successful expedition. This guy in the middle, Chris Raxworthy, he's a uh, herpetologist, another British guy, and um, he specializes in frogs and snakes and lizards. He actually, his main area of interest is Madagascar, but uh, he, uh, you know, he, he, he enjoyed that trip immensely, I think. Uh, me, of course, and then Neil Duncan down here, uh, my counterpart in mammalogy. So here's a little map to give you some idea of uh, where we were. Um, when you fly into New Guinea internationally, you pretty much always fly into Port Moresby down here on the peninsula. Um, Port Moresby has been the capital of Papua New Guinea for uh, some time during um, colonial period there, uh, the northern part of New Guinea was actually uh, in the early colonial period was part of German New Guinea and they had a different capital, but Port Moresby has been the capital for a long time. So you, you fly in there. Um, from there, we flew domestically to Mount Hagen, which is located in the central highlands up here. It's a fairly large city in a big valley, which has a, a temperate climate and uh, is quite heavily populated. And finally, we took a missionary flight, which you'll see later, to this place here, Malamonda. So our idea of this trip, uh, as you can see, New Guinea um, has a large spine through the middle of highland um, habitat with some isolated other mountain areas. Um, and this is what really accounts for the high degree of endemism. You've got this incredible topography with isolated mountain peaks and valleys. You've got two different lowland areas that are not in contact. Um, so you've got an incredibly diverse topography leading to incredibly diverse fauna. Um, so we were on the, on the north slope of the central uh, range. Um, the, the drainage there where we were working drains into the Sepik, which is the big river up here in the north. And um, it, it's also, there's also a big divide in here um, that separates um, us from these ranges here. So there was some, a lot of interest to see which taxa were actually in the area we were in. Um, we, in Port Moresby, we stayed in a uh, hotel named uh, Airways, which is kind of a, it's kind of a cool hotel. It's right by the airport. I think uh, it's the most popular hotel um, in town for, for, out, for uh, most people. Um, it has easy access to the airport and it has this funny uh, bar here inside the airplane. Um, and a great terrace where you can uh, watch a lot of birds. Got a lot of lifers up there. So we spent a few days in Moresby uh, preparing for the expedition. Um, going off grid like we did, um, you need a lot of batteries. So um, solar power is not an option in New Guinea in the highlands because it's constantly raining and cloudy. So all of our GPSs and cameras and uh, other devices require a lot of batteries. So. I think we bought all the batteries in Port Morris that day. I want to now introduce our New Guinea uh, team um, who we picked up in Morrisby. Um, we have Bulisa Iova. He's the now the chief curator uh, of the PNG National Museum. He's a herpetologist. Um, Mike Kiggle, um, he joined the ornithology team. He has a lot of experience with ornithology. And he's also um, an anthropologist and sort of development person, which is, he was really a fantastic person to have along. And then uh, Enoch Kale, mammalogist, and he was also amazing at um, doing logistics. He was, went ahead of us and arranged um, a lot of the camps and the porters, et cetera. So as I mentioned, to get from Hagen to our main, our base camp, uh, we flew 
with the MAF, uh, we call them the Missionary Air Force, but they're actually the Missionary Aviation Fellowship, I think. They are really the only way uh, game in town to get around in remote parts of New Guinea. They have um, scheduled you know, flights into most of the um, small airstrips all over the country and uh, really are the only way to get around. Um, our flight in was quite exciting. I'm going to show you a, a, a video now. Um, because um, of the topography, um, and, you know, basically the pilots fly just by sight. They're not using any kind of like uh, uh, navigation stuff. So um, we were flying often between and through valleys with the clouds above and green walls either side of it. And it was, it was pretty hairy. So I'm just going to show you this little video of uh, what it feels like to make this work. And you can see the topography is very steep. Um, there are like knife edge ridges and very steep uh, sides. It rains all the time. And you also see that the habitat is pretty much intact. There is, you know, there are very, very few people in these mountain ranges, largely because it's just too steep and too inhospitable for, uh, for humans to live. And this was about an hour plus flight into uh, Malamunda. Um, so this was our first site of our, of our base camp. You can see um, there's an airstrip here. It's just a piece of, uh, it's just a, a little bit of a, a ridge that's been leveled off, uh, it's grassed. And um, there's a small village here. It, it was set up originally by a mining company who were prospecting around here. Um, they, I guess, decided they wasn't profitable enough to uh, work. So they, um, they still maintain a presence there, but um, they have not developed the area, fortunately. Um, and because there's an airstrip and access to various things that an airstrip brings, including uh, religion, which I wasn't too happy about, but um, I won't say any more about that. Um, a lot of the people from the surrounding hills uh, sort of have established a village there. So it's not it wasn't actually a village prior to the um, mining company coming in. Here's a, another view of the, um, the landing. You can see the canopy is uh, even close to the village. It's pretty intact. And here we are going in for land. That was quite exciting. While I'm here, uh, could somebody, oh, here we go. Somebody from the crew tell me if you can see my cursor when it's on the screen, I'm just curious. So here was our landing um, with yeah, our yeah. welcoming party of all the villagers there. They like to uh, come out to visit when the plane comes in. So whenever a plane comes in, you know, everybody comes out and it's always a, a, a big day when, when people come in. Um, this gentleman here in the front, uh, you'll hear more about him later. This is Pindas Passos. He was our, I guess, our local um, coordinator. He arranged all of the uh, logistics for us in terms of the porters and the camp building and getting food, etc. He really was a, a fantastic help and uh, we could not have done it without him. Um, this is a village scene. Um, the typical village houses are up on stilts. In the middle, they have a, you can see this little wooden structure here is actually holding dirt so they can have a fire in the middle of a, a, a wooden hut. An interesting thing about New Guinea huts is that they don't have any kind of chimney, so the smoke just kind of 
percolates out through the roof and they're, they're quite smoky inside. Um, but apparently it's good for keeping uh, uh, insects away. So. And we spent a few days in Malamunda preparing for the trek up into the hills. Um, Chris Raxworthy here is cutting plastic sheeting. This is how uh, you catch lizards and snakes uh, in the forest. You, you build what are called uh, drift fences with bucket traps. And um, I think there's another picture here. Of, yeah, we have to get a huge amount of plastic sheeting and then cut it into appropriate sizes. It's kind of a, I think at this point, people didn't really understand what we were doing, but they soon, uh, they soon got it. Um, you'll notice this gentleman here has a nice ax. That's um, there. The, the folks there are amazing at building with just an ax and a machete, and um, they are. Oh, somebody's texting me. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, good. So um, we, uh, we spent a lot of time hanging around the village at the be waiting to go because um, there was a wedding going on and it was a, a, some weddings over there are, are quite complicated and there's a lot of um, transactions that go on over bride price as it's known, um, largely involving a number of how many pigs the the groom's family is going to give to the bride's family. And um, you know, you'll see pigs feature a lot in, in village life here. The, the women um, tend to be the pig husbandry uh, people. They take the pigs to the forest every day and, and manage the pigs. And they're really a, a more than just a food source. They're really a, a important um, asset to the, the people. They, they represent wealth and um, there are a lot of pigs around. It's kind of an interesting situation. So here are uh, here we are getting ready for the big um, trek up to our high camp. Um, we have a lot of gear, and there's a lot of. It takes a long time to figure out who's going to take what. Um, everything has to get weighed, and it's very complex. Um, we had about, I think. I think about 70 people, if I remember, um, carrying stuff. Remember, this is a, a camp. We're going up into the hills for about a month with seven uh, biologists. And then we always had about 10 local folk with us. And that is um, needs a lot of food. Uh, for every few more people you bring, you need another person just to carry the food for those people. So it kind of multiplies uh, pretty quickly. Um, these houses on the right here are actually the houses of the missionaries. They look a little more fancy. Um, the missionaries abandoned this village once they'd done what they intended to do, which was to learn the language and produce a, a New Testament, and then they're done. They don't really help the people very much at all, um, as far as I can tell, in terms of medicine or education, um, but there you go. So... I'm going to skip this video. So um, here we are. We got to the, the first bridge. Uh, in the middle here is Inok, the mammalogist I mentioned uh, before, and some of, the, some of our local helpers. Uh, we're about to cross this bridge here on the left. Um, to get to our field site, we had to cross several very deep ravines on these uh, rather precarious bridges that was quite exciting. I mean, I think if you, pretty much if you fell off this bridge, you would die. I mean, there's like a raging stream below with big rocks in it. So um, it was pretty, pretty hair raising at times. Here's a, here's Brett actually, who's about six foot three crossing the bridge. And uh, you can see it's kind of wobbly. One of our team, I'm not mentioning who, uh, was not very good with heights, so he had a, uh, he had a hard time. Okay. 
So um, yes, here's a little map of where we went. Um, so here's Malamunda down here with the airstrip. To get to our, our first camp, uh, we basically followed this river valley all the way up here and finally up to our um, camp. So you'll see the, the elevational rise is about a thousand meters, but unfortunately because there's all of these little side tributaries, it is probably like at least double that in terms of elevational rise and just probably the worst trails I've ever walked on. Plus it's raining, it's, it's really, really hard uh, work. Here's a, here's a view of what that valley looked like on, uh, from the plain. So we went all the way up in here and then up to this big ridge up at the top here. And, and this is a, you know, this is what a typical trail looks like. It's really no trail at all. It's just climbing over logs, um, getting scratched up by spiny, spiny uh, palms and just falling over. And it's like, it was very hard. Um, we stopped halfway up uh, for the night in one of these um, uh, bush houses, they call them. These are like the, um, most of the families who live down in the village, traditionally, their traditional lands are up in the hills and they still maintain little houses up there for when they go to work on the land. So um, they, we were, they were nice enough to let us sleep in their, in their house uh, on the way up. And finally, uh, we arranged, we arrived at our base camp. Um, this is, it's already been set up a little bit here with a, but uh, Enoch had been up there in advance with a crew and just with their axes and machetes, they had built this amazing clearing in the forest. And as you can see here, they built um, platforms to keep our tents up off the ground uh, and, and sort of paved the main central courtyard with um, split logs. So it didn't turn into like a mud pit because um, this is a dry moment, but it's probably the wettest place I've ever been. It rains constantly. You can see the trees are just covered in, in moss. Um, it's, it's really a very wet environment. Another view of one of our, our sleeping platforms. Um, and again, this is all done just with axes and you can see even no nails. It's all tied together with uh, vines and bush rope, as they call it. And there's a little look inside. Um, it's kind of weird to have a washing line because ne nothing ever gets dry, it just molds. It's disgusting. And another view of the, the wet camp. Over here is the, the, the kitchen tent. Um, and our, our guides usually sleep in there. They like to sleep around the fire. And um, I can't really blame them. Um, it was kind of cold. Uh, but they don't really have any um, clothing that is warm enough, so um, the fires are, are good for them. Just... So the field work um, is not very complicated. It's mostly about collecting and preserving specimens. Uh, Neil here is a mammalogist and he was trapping and various kinds and netting uh, mostly small mammals, all small mammals, and uh, bats. So rodents, small marsupials, and uh, bats. But an amazing diversity of those uh, there. Um, this is me. You'll see uh, this is a, me looking a little grumpy. Um, this is a typical field lab. Um, even though um, you're in an amazing place with lots of really great birds, you spend most of your time sitting in your lab uh, preparing specimens. It's not um, as glamorous as some people might think. It's very different from a birding uh, trip. And of course, it's always raining. Here's Brett uh, preparing a specimen um, in the rain. And obviously, it's pretty cold. We're all wearing hats and fleeces um, up there. Here's Chris and Belisa um, prepping frogs. Um, they have a much easier job than ornithologists because they uh, just use formalin and alcohol to preserve their whole animals. Um, 
They don't have to do skin preparation, which is quite time consuming. Um, one nice thing about herps is that they they really can take great photographs. Uh, here's Chris getting ready to photograph uh, a snake. Um, the local folks really don't like snakes, um, so they're a little nervous about it. They there aren't really too many poisonous snakes there, but um, yeah. So here's some of the Chris takes some pretty nice uh, snake and and other herp photographs. This one is a particularly interesting snake. Um, this is one of these blind leaf litter snakes, and fortunately. Um, this was the only one we got, and I, I believe Chris told me this is a new species. Um, and the way you catch a lot of these uh, critters is by drift fence. And this is, you remember, we were cutting um, plastic fencing before. This is how you make a drift fence. You support a plastic sheet, and then every so often you sink a bucket. So when the, the lizards hit the fence, they come along and fall into the bucket. Here's some. Uh, some of the kind of lizards we got there, um, a lot of skinks of various kinds, really beautiful animals. And also an amazing variety of frogs. Now, all these frogs uh, here are about, you know, maybe an inch or less long. There's an incredible diversity of, um, of frogs there. And uh, they're, they're really beautiful. Um, I believe there are several new species coming out of this trip, but it takes a long time because the comparative material is so hard, widely, widely dispersed and uh, hard to get at. One interesting uh, thing we found were these frogs that had uh, leeches um, living inside of them, uh, which was sort of bizarre. Nobody had ever seen that before. So we spent about, I think two and a half weeks up at that camp, uh, getting very wet, and then um, came back down to the village for a few days to uh, kind of recover and dry out and uh, did a little more collecting at that elevation. Um, and we also got a little bit more time to spend with the villagers. One of uh, my favorite folk we met was this man, Kalabi who was something of a, a I guess a shaman, um, who certainly knowledgeable about um, local wildlife. And one of the uh, things we did was to have him go through the field guide with Mike. Here. So Mike is uh, talking to the to him about uh, the local names for for the, many of the birds. Many this language is restricted to a, a small area. Only a few thousand people are known to speak it, and so we were recording um, all the names of the birds because the missionaries, I think, don't bother with that. So um, that's another interesting little side project. Uh, speaking of missionaries, um, you can see on a Sunday, they, uh, our field guys um, break out the guitars and, and start singing, uh, singing gospel songs. Very, very uh, great voices. Yeah, I was I was kind of surprised when this this went down on a Sunday because I, I had no no idea that these guys could sing songs and play guitars. It's a, kind of an interesting uh, thing. Uh, one another thing we did there, um, which was new for me, was to uh, blog from the field. We had a satellite um, phone um, type thing, and we were able to upload 
photographs and text. So we were actually sending uh, blog posts back to the museum and um, the local kids were, were just fascinated by our, our stuff. Uh, our second camp um, was down lower um, where it was um, at least warmer, but uh, just as wet. And even though we'd only come down by about a thousand meters, um, the bird fauna was almost um, entirely different, many, many different species. So even within a, a, a short distance, you get um, completely different uh, species according to the elevation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from other areas. Um, the forest was a lot taller, not quite as mossy and wet. And uh, I just want to show you a few little shots of uh, camp life. Generally, the um, our field crew like to hang around uh, in the kitchen and uh, I don't blame them. It's really a nice place to sit and uh, have some tea and um, talk. And uh, they were incredible at making, um, keeping the fire going, even though these, they were, none of the wood we were using was old. It was all freshly cut wood. And they had a system for um, drying and uh, keeping the fires going. So typically, um, generally, uh, our diet was pretty much the same. We had uh, rice and uh, sometimes instant noodles. And then our main uh, or only really protein sources were uh, canned mackerel and corned beef, um, which uh, yeah, not the greatest food you'll ever have. Um, the corned beef uh, probably doesn't have that much real meat in it. It's a lot of the nasty bits uh, all cut up and, and a lot of fat, um, but uh, that's what we had. And then um, another staple in Melanesia are uh, what they call biscuit. Um, which are essentially hardtack uh, crackers, very, very tough um, hard crackers that we would have with our, our tea in the morning. Um, and uh, the guys would often um, supplement with local uh, food. Um, this was a real favorite. These are larvae of um, cerambicid beetles. Um, longhorn beetles that live in uh, rotting trees and almost every day we'd hear the crash of a rotting tree and a lot of shouting and then the guys would come back with um, a big bag of these things which were pretty tasty. I guess they were sort of like um, kind of like a bland shrimp but with a leathery outside and um, they're very popular. Um, very the, the diet of the folks in the highlands is rather poor on protein. So these kind of supplements are uh, really uh, salt after. Um, so I talk a bit about the uh, herps, but the, uh, the mammals were also um, really interesting there. This is Inok with um, one of the Nictamini uh, tube nose fruit bats. Um, these are really uh, interesting animals. They have these strange uh, tubular noses and a lot of colored, uh, the pattern on their back um, is kind of cool. They're kind of like a lime green spotting. And here are a few other uh, of the mammals we got there. Um, a lot of small uh, marsupials, various bandicoots and other small um, carnivorous mammals, and uh, here's a, not a fruit bat, it's a, uh, I'm not sure what the species is, but a really nice looking bat. This little mouse here uh, apparently is a new species, uh, we're still working on that. So finally, um, time to leave. When you leave on a, one of those small planes, um, everything, including yourself, has to get weighed and counted up because um, there are limits to, to loading those planes. So here we are weighing all of our luggage. And uh, this is the uh, 
this is the remaining group who, who, who were still there. Um, some of the group left a little earlier um, and looking a lot more ragged than we were uh, back at the AMNH six weeks before. So with that, um, I'd like to thank um, all the uh, participants of the expedition, particularly the people of Malamunda and uh, Pindas, our, our local helper and all of our field crew. These are most of the guys here. Um, and with that, I guess I can take any questions if there's time. Yeah. Hi, so I'm uh, here to facilitate questions. Uh, thank you, Paul, so much. That was a great talk. I also want to let everyone know that I'm modeling the Linnaean baseball cap that everyone can uh, find on our website. It's perfect pandemic wear for those of you who are skipping a few showers or cutting your hair with kitchen scissors. So check our website. Um, we have some good questions, and if you want to keep populating the q and I can select um, ones that come in, but I'm going to start with a great one we had from Eric Eckholm, who wants to know why are so many birds in Papua New Guinea so colorful? Hmm. Well, I think I just picked, I think I picked the more colorful ones for the slideshow. I think, um, yeah, I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, I think people often say, well, birds, how come birds in the tropics are so colorful? But I say, well, haven't you ever seen like a scarlet tanager or a Baltimore Oriole or an indigo bunting? I mean, I think there are colorful birds everywhere. Um, I don't think that necessarily the New Guinea birds are, are any more colorful. Um, so Lots of black and brown birds there, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, little brown jobs are found around the world. Like yeah. we can always count on them. Um, so Sherry Felix wanted to know, do you catch and release to obtain genetic material? Uh, no, we collect. We collect the specimens. We, we use the knives and we prepare specimens typically. Not, not every specimen, but I mean, some, we don't have the, the, t the time to be able to actually you know, you know, it, you're limited. So it's, we're selectively collecting, I would say, but we don't catch in the, we, uh, many things we release, but um, we typically don't take genetic material from things we release because then we don't have any voucher. You can't, having a tissue sample without a voucher specimen is not that useful because, uh, you know, you don't have anything to, you know, base your tissue on, if you like. Um, so another question we have is um, from Teresa um, Pesek, who wants to know if you have seen any evidence of climate change while you've been on any of the collection expeditions. Well, I haven't, I mean, I haven't personally seen, I mean, on a course of a four week expedition, you I know, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but there's certainly a lot of evidence of climate change in New Guinea, for example. Um, Many of the glaciers that were there a hundred years ago are completely gone now. So there is a warming and um, high, level, high elevation birds are basically being forced, you know, they're going to run out of habitat at some point because they're not going to be any high cold areas left as the, as the, as the climate warms and, and the habitat changes. Um, but that's, that's, you know, over, a hundred years, not over the course of, a, of an expedition. But, um, one thing you do see a lot, of course, is deforestation uh, leading to, you know, um, landslides, silting of rivers. Um, that's, a, that's a big problem in New Guinea. And particularly another big problem in New Guinea is mining. There's been some horrible uh, environmental destruction through um, some of these big mines that are there, which have completely destroyed whole river systems. Um, so Miriam Murkowski has a question I think many really want to know, and that's, um, did you find any new bird species when you were there? We did not find any new bird species. Um, that's kind of um, unlikely, an unlikely thing. It could happen. Um, one thing we might find, though, is like the work we do particularly Brett. So Brett's collected in many highland areas through New Guinea. 
and he's looking at some of the species that are found through these regions and are also in, in sort of isolated mountaintops. So by doing the genetic work, he is hoping to, you know, maybe showing that some of these, what we once thought of as single species are actually a complex of multiple species. So we're doing that kind of genetic work to look at this geographic variation to find out whether um, there actually are more cryptic species, if you like, amongst these species. But finding something that's never been described before is fairly unlikely, at least in this area. But amongst the, um, you know, the frogs, certainly, and, and um, herpetology, there are um, almost certainly many new species because um, the ranges of these uh, things tend to be smaller. Um, and I think we'll wrap it up with one final question. And this one is from Vicki Seabrook, who wants to know, and this is a great question because you are uniquely qualified to answer such a question, but how did you preserve specimens? Um, so <laughs> how do we preserve? So we, we have three primary uh, ways of preserving specimens. The traditional way is to make what we call a study skin, which um, is sort of a bird that's just had the insides moved, uh, removed and it's sort of dry and its wings are by its side and its feet are sort of crossed over. Um, we also make whole birds. We also preserve whole birds in spirit or, or formaldehyde. Um, this is, in the old days that was to, so they could later be dissected. So you could look at any kind of the soft parts for, for whatever purposes you might have. Like I'm trying to understand how birds of paradise, you know, make those feathers stand up and do the things they do or whatever. But nowadays um, with CT scanning, we can put whole birds in a scanner and get kind of 3D models of the entire bird. Uh, we also make um, dry ske skeletons, which are, they're rough prepared in the field. And then when we get them back to the museum, we use domestic beetles to clean them. So we get whole skeletons that people um, can then study. Okay, I lied, one more. And this one is kind of close to my own heart. So Jim Muchmore wants to know, are there any, or did you observe any local NGOs working on conservation efforts? Um, not where we, no, no, where we went was so remote that um, I didn't, no, no, I don't think any biologist has ever been to this site before. Um, there are certainly NGOs working in Papua New Guinea on conservation, but not in the region we were in. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up. And Paul, thanks again for being our first Zoom victim. Um, okay. It looks like we still have a ton of attendees. So it seems like this is successful and people were able to join probably from all across the country, which is a Linnaean first. So thanks so much. And I'm, with that, I'm gonna pass it back to our president, Ken Chea. Thank you, Rochelle and Paul. Thank you especially for a, an outstanding presentation. Um, I just have to ask uh, one question myself. I, uh, it's burning in my mind. Um, what do you prefer, canned mackerel, canned corned beef, or uh, longhorn lizard, longhorn beetle larvae? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I like to, I mean, the mackerel, you know, I like to switch it up, you know. I, I can, I, I grew up eating corned beef in England, so I, I'm kind of used to it. I, you know, you just take it straight out of the can and put it on one of those crackers, and that's that's breakfast. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, I hope that everyone who uh, had the opportunity to be with us tonight uh, will return for next month's program, when we present Jonathan Slot and the salmon-eating owls of Russia. Uh, a quest to study and save Blakison's fish owls, the largest owls in the world. Uh, that's coming up next month in October. And until then, good birding, everyone. Stay healthy, stay active, and have a good night.